All right, welcome everyone to uh, another edition of Alta's Title Topics webinars. These are Alta's free presentations that we offer uh, every month on issues important to title professionals. I'm Jeremy Yowie, Alta's Vice President of Communications, and today we've got a, a fantastic webinar planned for today. I'm sure everyone's been working hard to comply with the, the various regulatory changes we've been dealing with the past uh, year or so. Uh, it's also important to continue developing uh, new sales strategies. Uh, 2016 has been a, a pretty strong year so far. However, we've seen the NBA is forecast, forecasting a 20% drop in mortgage originations for uh, next year. So that's going to require some additional effort uh, to keep bringing business in in the door and today's speaker is really going to, going to help provide some strategies on how to do this. Uh, real quick before starting, I just need to touch on a, a few housekeeping items. A uh, copy of today's presentation was emailed about a half hour ago to uh, all the registrants. If you didn't get it, uh, shoot me an email and I will send you a copy after the webinar and my email is jyohe at alta.org and that's J-Y-O-H-E at A-L-T-A dot org. And I'll also uh, send everyone a little message to the chat box as well, so you have the email there. Uh, all participant lines are muted for today's presentation. If at any time you have a question, uh, use the question box, and we'll, we'll, we'll hold some time at the end uh, to address questions. Um, Real quick also, to down, if you need to download the presentation, you can do it from the handout section on, on the GoToWebinar window screen there as well. And as an added benefit, today's, today's presentation is being recorded. After it's processed, the recording will be available on Alta's uh, website at alta.org forward slash title topics. Again, that's alta.org forward slash title topics. And I need to quickly thanks, thank Fidelity for sponsoring our title topics webinars this year. Uh, their support allows us to continue providing these educational opportunities free of charge. And with that out of the way, let me introduce uh, today's speaker. Uh, today we have Cynthia McGovern, or as many uh, of you out in the industry know her as Dr. Cindy. Uh, she is the founder of Orange Leaf Consulting. Uh, Cynthia has a master's degree in marketing communications and a doctorate in organizational communication. Uh, if you haven't heard her speak at an ALT event or previous web webinar, you are definitely in for a treat today. And uh, Cynthia, with that out of the way, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jeremy. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. I want to thank Alta for having me back. This is one of my most favorite topics of all time. I really believe that everyone is a salesperson. And I know those of you that have seen me speak or have heard me speak before, you know, my journey didn't begin in sales, and I would never wanted to be in sales and basically railed against it my entire life until I finally woke up one day and said, oh, yeah, I guess I am a salesperson. <laughs> so when Jeremy and I were talking about doing a webinar, this seemed like such a great time to have this discussion with you all with regard to everybody can sell. You know, we're coming through trade, we're coming through all this compliance stuff, everything is kind of coming back around. And like Jeremy said, we are forecasting a dip. So we've got to be making sure that we have all hands on deck to be able to continue to grow the business. So today we're going to talk a little bit about how everyone sells. And truly, everybody sells every day. And the key to get the team around you to sell is to align around common objectives. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And we're going to discuss reframing sales and changing industry paradigms in the way that we look at things and then empowering others to grow, and finally some proven growth strategies in every single market. So the first thing I want to talk about is the icky issue of sales. And like I said, I never wanted to be a salesperson. I called myself a marketer, believe it or not, because I thought that sounded better than sales. But truth be told, we are all in sales. And you know, 20 years into the career at this point um, in sales, I sit there and I go, why didn't anybody teach me this in high school? Why wasn't this something that was a life skill? I mean, this, this was one of those things that I think my life would have been very different if I had been taught this earlier on. And I'll never forget it. I had a manager when I first started truly selling, like straight cold calling type selling. And he said, if you learn to sell, it's going to change your life. And of course, I, being the smart aleck that I am, rolled my eyes and went, whatever, <laughs> and went back to being my marketing self. And turns out he was right. 
And it's really amazing because we all have this icky feeling around the word sales because we think of that guy or gal trying to sell us a used car or the timeshare salesperson or something that's a very pushy version of sales. But what's interesting is sales is all around us and you are actually selling every single day. And if you think about the way that you get your kids to eat their vegetables, or you convince your spouse to go for Chinese versus hamburgers, or you convince your friends to meet at 6 o'clock instead of 7 o'clock, you convince the realtor to do the closing at 2.30 instead of 2. Those are all sales. We just don't call it that. We call it things like persuasion or you know, convincing. But it's actually the same process as a sales process if you look at it from a fundamental behavioral standpoint. The other thing that I think is interesting about sales is we all actually inherently know how to do this. I mean, if you, if you have ever been around a two-year-old, they are some of the best salespeople on the planet <laughs> because they'll basically keep asking until you either give in or you say, absolutely no, never going to happen, and you leave the store kind of a thing. But it's funny because we forget how to do it along the way. And so we kind of rail against the sales piece thinking, oh, no, I remember this rejection thing I had when I was four years old. So I never want to do it again. But I just want you to think about the fact that we are all selling. And so whether you're an owner, you're an underwriter, you're a title agent, you're an escrow officer, you're a sales rep, whoever you are on the phone today, you are all selling in every single aspect of your life, truth be told. But to get everybody around you selling, you've kind of got to address your own icky stuff first. Because if you're going to be leading the change, especially my managers and owners on the phone, you're the ones that have to address what your beef is around sales too. And so start with that, but don't gloss over this. And I know that sounds funny. It's like, why would we talk about the part that everybody's afraid of? That's exactly what I want you to do. I want you to talk about the fact that this is icky. Because whether you have this conversation with your team or not, trust me, they're having this conversation in their head. So you might as well bring it out. Really quick story on that. Uh, I was doing a seminar for a group of underwriters, true actual underwriters, like the ones making underwriting decisions. And I started the whole two days with this. And we talked about the icky factor, and we talked about everybody's discomfort. And once you bring out the discomfort and you bring out what the issues are around it, it's a whole lot easier to deal with. And even some of these folks were coming out you know, later in the day and the next day saying, you know, I never really thought about it in that way, that I do sell all day, but I just don't call it that. So I think you'll find that if you address this issue really upfront, you're going to have great success in getting folks around you to be selling. So as Jeremy had mentioned, and as we all know very, very well, the industry has changed. But I think it's an opportunity for us. And if you've heard me speak in the last probably two years, I've been saying all this change in the industry is a good thing because it gives us something to talk about. If it were status quo, it's kind of like, yeah, hi, how you doing? OK, we got a closing. Yay. But we have things to talk about now. So I think it's really wonderful. But the thing that hasn't changed in our industry is the way that we sell. So it's really funny to me, like from an outside perspective, and again, I'm a consultant, but looking at it and saying, okay, we've changed technology, we've changed processes, we've changed compliance regulations, but we're still selling very similarly to the way that we did 20 years ago. So maybe it's time to look at that. Maybe it's time to look at the way that we're selling. I mean, technology, government oversight, offshore globalization, all these things have changed, but think about your sales process. What could be different today? And what I would invite you to think about is, how did you sell when you first got in the business? And is it different than what you're doing right now? Because if it's not, you've got to think about the fact that your customer is different. The needs are different. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but we have customers that only text. I, that just blows my mind. They do not check email, and their voicemail is always full. <laughs> but they will text all day long. So you know, if we're selling to them via email flyers, that ain't working. So we've got to be thinking about ways that we're selling. And the same thing with even just driving around. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of my first part of the career was driving around and seeing people. Realtors aren't in the office anymore. Your clients aren't available to talk to you right now. They're busy. So how do you get in front of these folks when the old tactics don't work? So this is another thing that you can talk to your team about. And you know, sales folks, you can bring your whole escrow team in and talk about this. 
managers, you can bring the whole company in together. Everybody can have this dialogue around what did we do to build the business in the first place? How has our customer changed? And what we can do about it now? And a good way to start that conversation is to talk about the fact that we're all trying to do the same thing. In title insurance, all we're trying to do is get the deal closed and get everybody paid. <laughs> I mean, truth be told, that's what we're trying to do. And everybody's on the same boat, whether you're the receptionist, you're the escrow officer, you're the processor, you're the salesperson, you're the post closer, doesn't matter. Underwriter, all of the above, we're all trying to do the same thing. So if you think about it almost like a relay race, and as you're passing the baton, who has what role, think about what the sales moment is when you have the baton. So if you think about it like this, if you are the receptionist, your baton is when that client calls in. Well, there's a sales moment there, and it's actually about how they experience that phone call. And we've all been the recipient of a really bad phone call at some point where somebody was screaming and everything, but it's the way that you handle it. It's the way that receptionist responds to that moment. That's a sales moment in my opinion. Same thing when you're getting ready to close, you're clear to close, and you make a call or you send an email and the agent calls you back and has some questions. That's a sales moment. But we don't look at them as sales moments. In fact, in our, our industry, I think we call it customer service, awfully often. <laughs> and so I would love to take the word customer service out. I think customer service diminishes how hard we really do work as an industry. And I think you want to talk about it as the customer experience. So if you can get the team aligned around this, this thought of sales and that it's not super icky, the thought around the fact that we're all just trying to do the same thing, then you can really have the conversation. Now, for my managers and owners on the phone, I want you to think about goals because part of it is getting the team also wrapped around the fact that we're trying to reach some goals. It's not just about getting the deal closed, but what are the key results for the organization? And does everybody know that? And I'll tell you an interesting thing that we find a lot. The first thing we do with an organization is we do an assessment, and these are one-on-one -on -one confidential calls with all the forward-facing people. One of our questions is always, what are the goals for this month? And you would be amazed at how many people cannot tell us that. And it's interesting because you would hope that sales can. You would even hope that probably escrow can. But why doesn't the receptionist know? Why doesn't the other processors know? Why don't all these people know? They're all playing the game. They all have that baton at some point. So it's almost like not sharing with them how to keep score in this baton race that we have. They've got to know. Also think about how you communicate the progress of where we are. I mean, if you're not having at least monthly meetings with your team, you definitely want to be. For the sales folks on the phone, same thing. Are you meeting with your escrow team? Are you meeting with them and talking about where you guys are, what their desk looks like, how much you want to build it, that kind of thing. Think about how you're communicating that. And then thinking from a managerial standpoint, are you shielding them from the bad news? And are you overly optimistic? Let them know what's going on. The rumor mill can be your friend and it can be your worst enemy. But if you're truly trying to align the team around a common goal so you can get everyone selling, they've got to know the good, the bad, and the ugly. And they've got to know it up front. So we're in such a reactive business. It's just the, the nature of our industry. But think about how you can co communicate with them more proactively. And I think scheduling those monthly meetings is a great place to start. But also one-on-ones are good too. So as the owner, as the manager, as the leader, it is your job to make sure that the objectives are clear before you even start getting anyone thinking about sales. So that's step one. Then we need to talk about reframing sales, and, you know, changing an industry paradigm from the inside out and redefining the sale. I look at it as we're all in the same boat, so we might as well row together. But it is about getting everybody to figure out how to grow. And you've got to shatter those perceptions of that, I'm not a salesperson. I can't do this. And I always hear people say, service is sales. I actually disagree. And I'll tell you why. We do a lot of market research with clients, your clients, actually. We do a lot of work with agents, and then we do a lot of work with real estate agents and lenders to understand what it is they expect from their title company. And when we ask them about service, it's never one of the top things 
that they are looking for. And so we ask that. We're like, well, you never mentioned customer service. And they say, well, that's an expectation. I better be getting customer service or I'll go somewhere else. So be really careful about saying, well, we give good customer service, so that's sales, because it's not. Giving customer service is sort of the bare minimum to stay in the game. Sales is that extra added effort. Sales is the extra piece of making sure they're getting all of their needs met in every way, shape, or form. Another piece of it is walking the talk. Executive level selling is so crucial. I cannot say this enough, guys. A lot of times the leadership are the ones that end up being pulled aside to, to go handle problems and things like that, and I totally understand it. But you've got to be selling as well and modeling the behavior for the rest of your team. That's really going to make all the difference in the world. If they can see you do it and share your own discomfort about it too. Don't feel like you have to make it look so easy. And I might even argue, in fact, if you make it look too easy, it makes it harder for them. So share with them the fact that, gosh, you know, this does feel kind of awkward, but hey, I did it. Let them know you're human and let them know that you're practicing this too. But you do have to walk the talk for them to really want to rally behind it. And one of my favorite things to ask people is, well, what else do you think you could do? And in our assessments, this is one of our questions that we close with. We say, well, what else do you think you could be doing in your role to grow the business? And it's amazing what people will come up with because they start thinking about their role and they think about when they're talking to customers and potential customers and they start identifying opportunity. But the problem is we just don't give them the time to think about it because we're busy running hurdles, right? We're doing that relay race. So if you can give them a chance to think about what they could do differently that might be able to help grow the business, I think you'll come up with some really fun and creative ideas that really could empower everyone. Now sales is growth, and we talk a lot about this being a relationship business, and it in fact is, and it is key in our business. Relationships are king, but they're not everything. You've got to be asking for referrals. You've got to leverage those relationships to get you more relationships. And it's funny because, especially if we're calling on realtors, you're selling to salespeople. <laughs> and we forget that a lot of times. We think, oh, it's, you know, I can't do that, I can't ask them. You're selling to someone that makes their living selling. So they get it. And especially from a referral standpoint, realtors love referrals. So making sure that we're asking for them. But if you don't ask, you don't get. So making sure that we see it as, okay, I've got this relationship, I can leverage it with referrals to get more business. And sales is job security, it's just a fact. If you're attached to revenue, you guys know this, you're not going anywhere. And it is just persuasion, it's convincing someone else of what you want them to do. And like I said in the very beginning of our session today, you sell every single day. You just don't call it sales. So if you think about sales as growth and the way that we can grow the business, you've had the icky conversation with everybody. You've talked about those common goals. You've put a stake in the ground and said, okay, guys, this is where we're going. This is how we're going to win the month. And now we're talking about ways we can do it. Here's a couple growth strategies for you. The first one is to retain the current clients that you have. That sounds really easy, but it's not. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. Referring, that's the referral piece. Ask and you shall receive. Renewing, renewing the relationship with the cheaters. I hate to tell you this, but your clients cheat on you. The only reason I know that is because they tell us when we do surveys. <laughs> so if you know that they're using another title company or you know they're using another underwriter, how much more business could you be getting from them? And that's the question and that's the conversation. And then revive. These are the folks that used to do business with you but ran away. And it's interesting when we talk about these with our clients because sometimes we forget the people that went, went away because we haven't seen them in so long. And then finally, recruit. And this is the non-directing agent. So this is for the title agent and the direct folks on the call. This is the folks that are on the other side of the deal, the non-directing side. And if you're in a split closing market, same thing. It's the one that you don't have, the person that did not choose your company or your firm to represent them. So let's go through these. First thing, client retention. Seems easy. We think if we service them, they will stay. Well, let me tell you a little bit of uh, what we find out in our surveys. We ask folks why they leave. 
why they choose another title company or they choose another underwriter. The number one answer in seven and a half years of having this company and doing this research, they tell us we see that they feel you get too busy for them. So that means they weren't getting enough love. And that's tough. It's tough to hear. So how are we thanking them for their loyalty? How are we letting them know that we love them and that we appreciate their business? And that's a really big thing. If you do not have a client loyalty process or program, you need one. And it could just be doing things like reviewing business trends from last year into this year and asking for future commitments, knowing their preferences and some personal information about them, their birthday, I mean, the basics that we usually do. But if they've been a client of yours for 10 years and they get the same e-card on their birthday, that's not enough anymore. So finding ways that we can continue to show them that we appreciate them. And then, of course, demonstrating through deeds and words that they're not taken for granted, as you know, but also checking with them other than a file update. And here's one of my favorites to do. So if you've got a client that's been a loyal client of yours, even for two years, and you've celebrated milestones with them, their first order, their 50th order, whatever it happens to be, what else have you spoken to them, though? Think about it. It's typically talking to them about a file. When's the last time you just called and said, hey, Jeremy, I just want to let you know I'm thinking about you. How is business? How are you guys faring in this? You know, the projections say we're going down 20%. What do you think? Just talk to them. Another thing that you can do is twice a year at a minimum, business reviews. You ask them how their business is going, and we find out what they need from us that's different than what they've been getting. When's the last time we did a vitals check? on these relationships. That's a great place to start, and it gives you an excuse to sit down with them. You will be surprised how much information you can glean in a vital check conversation simply by asking. And it deepens the relationship, because in that moment, you're not necessarily asking for business. You will at the end, obviously. But you're really asking, hey, we love you, but what else do you need from us? What else could we be doing differently? to make your life easier when you're out there selling. Or if you're an underwriter, same thing with your agents. You do an audit every year, but that's about you, not them. So when do you sit down with them and talk about their business and what their needs are, what their goals are, and how you guys can serve them? I mean, for my underwriters on the phone, you guys have umpteen resources. But do your agents know that, and do they know how to use them? So thinking about all those pieces, that's a great retention tactic, strategy, and progress that you could make as a team. Now, the other thing with retention is making sure that other team members know them as well. Retention tactic could also be layering the relationship within your organization. If I'm a sales rep and I call on the realtor Donna, and Donna and I are buds, and clearly Donna knows Kirsten, who is my processor, that's great. But could I bring my manager in to go and talk to Donna at some point? Could I bring my attorney in to talk to Donna at some point? That's also a retention tactic, just letting them know how important they are. So from retention and from our loyal clients come those referrals. And you've got to ask for it, though. And this is one of my favorite things when I talk to realtors. And I've coached literally dozens and dozens of realtors. And they always say, well, I work by referral. Well, no, you don't. <laughs> you get referrals. If you work by referral, that means you will not take on a client unless they are referred in. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't know any realtor that's not going to take on somebody that calls. So with referrals, it's about how you ask them to make an introduction or to send you a name. And the best way to do it is to convey the appreciation for them. Let them know you love them and you want more clients just like them. And if we're thinking about it from a realtor standpoint, realtors love to be told this, right? They love to know that you love them, stroke the ego, happy realtor. Same thing for an agent, though. Let them know that you love the way they do business, that you're proud to be a partner with them because of their professionalism. That's huge. And then ask them for an introduction. Ask them for a referral. And yes, I did say you can ask an agent for an, a referral. I did say it, yep. But you develop a list of people that you don't work with. And you can share that with your key clients and see who they know. And you can create a system for asking your clients every you know, three months, four months, whatever feels comfortable. 
And then close to the end of the month, you can even do that too. If you're on the agency side or direct side, hey, I need your help before the end of the month. I'm trying to meet three new people. Do you have anybody in your office that I should know? Another way for referrals is asking industry vendors. A lot of our business actually comes from people we know in the industry who make those introductions for us, perhaps a technology company that we've worked with who knows an agent that wants to grow their business, or perhaps an underwriter that we've done work with that knows agents that are looking to grow, or an agent that knows an underwriter that's willing to grow. I'm very grateful for that. That's a, a great, you know, a, a, a great blessing that I, the way I look at it, for our business because they're willing to send business our way and make introductions for us. But I do ask. And so I think that's the key, is making sure you have a system for asking. But there's a little bit of magic to it, in that you thank them for their business, you thank them for their loyalty, you let them know what you love about them, and give them some direction of who you want. Because the other thing is, especially if you're asking a realtor, they're going to send you every new realtor in their office, <laughs> because they don't have anybody yet, right? So let them know that you're looking for more clients like them the professional ones, the sane ones, you can say that too. But let's give them a little direction of what it is you're looking for so they can make those introductions. But more importantly, if you have a list, you can even say, hey, Jeremy, could you introduce me to Donna? I'd love the opportunity to work with her the way that you and I have worked together. And that's pretty powerful stuff. And remember, people like to help other people. And I, I call helpaholics, and I'm a total helpaholic. I love to help people. I mean, if you call me and ask me, places to see in San Francisco, you're going to get like a spreadsheet. You're not just going to get an email with like four things because I love to help people. It's just kind of in my DNA. Most people do like to help because it feels good to help other people. So with a referral, you're just asking for their help. So give them that opportunity to repay the favor. You've been helping them. You've been closing their business for them. You've been a good a business partner. This is a chance for them to give something back to you. And it's pretty powerful. Then we can talk about renewing and reviving. And these two kind of go together, but not really. Renewing and reviving are, are for the ones that we don't see so much and the ones that we see half the time. So revisiting lost clients or returning, or determining how to regain them, you've got to ask. And a lot of folks that leave, we just let them go because we were so busy. We didn't know. And so you've got to bring them back and ask them, hey, what happened? I'm sorry we split. Tell me what happened there. And you might hear some pretty bad stuff about how they feel like we got too busy for them or they didn't feel loved. You're gonna, you might hear some, some tough stuff. But get them to talk because most of the time they'll talk themselves out and then you get an opportunity to ask them to come home. So that's a reviving piece. And the renewing piece is what I had mentioned earlier about people who split the business. And if you look at the statistics, they have at least two title agents and at least two underwriters. So if you look at it that way, you're at least splitting business with someone else. So there's an opportunity to ask for a greater commitment. Here's the catch for that. Don't assume that because their business goes up, our split will go up. And hear me out on that. Because you have a relationship with them, so your brand A and brand B also has a relationship with them. That's great. But there are nine other brands knocking on their door every single day, promising them the moon if they would just send some business their way. So don't assume that that split is just between the two existing companies. There's other people that they can easily split it with. So be real careful about how you ask. And one of the ways you can do it is just talking about the things that you're doing with them differently. Share your goals, ask for their support, but you start with even talking about their goals. This, for the renewal piece, is a great opportunity to do a business review, like I had mentioned before. So their retention and renew can go together. You can literally sit them down and say, I want to talk about business. We're going into Q4. You know, things are typically slowing down. Let's talk about how to keep the ball rolling for you, keep your business going. And in that, you can talk about that business split. You guys know how much business you get from them, or maybe you don't. Maybe it's a realtor that you know they send some business somewhere else, but you don't have access to reports that say just how much. Ask them their goals. Say, well, how much more do you want to do before the end of the year? How many more sides of transactions do you expect to close? And then what percentage of those will you be sending to us? 
don't be afraid to ask. And that's one of the things I find a lot of times when I'm coaching folks is they're afraid to ask for the numbers or the percentage. Let's reframe that too. Think about it like this. If we are the factory that makes the widget, so if we're a title agent, we're making the widget, which is that closing packet and everything so that they can go and get into their home. Or if you're an underwriter, you're doing the underwriting so they can then get the pack closed, all that good stuff. So we're the widget makers. Don't we need to know how many widgets they're going to be ordering this year so we can be staffed appropriately? And that's a really simplistic way to look at it, but it helps you to get over that fear of asking what the expectation is of their business. And I hear a lot of folks say, well, I feel like I'm prying or I feel like I'm nosy if I ask them that. But if we are the widget factory, those are things we need to know because we want to stay fully staffed so we can support them, so we can make sure that they, in fact, are taken care of and used to the service that they expect from us. And then finally, this is one of my most favorites of all time, the other side agent. Um, a lot of our success with our organizations that we work with comes from implementing this one right here. So put a star next to this one on your paper. The other side agent expects less. So it's kind of easy to impress them. I hate to say it, but it's true. They don't expect to hear from you. They didn't pick you. They're not directing anything. So they're like, all right, just send me my money. So a way to do this is what I call a three-point touch system. And the first thing is you conduct a service expectations interview with them within one day of opening. Now think about who does that. Is that your receptionist? Is it your order entry person? Is it the processor? You know, you got to kind of determine who's going to be responsible for this. But truly, it's a phone call. And I hear that again, not an email. This is a phone call. And I call and I say, hey, Jeremy, it's Cindy at XYZ Title. How are you today? And Jeremy's like, I'm fine. And he's trying to figure out why I'm calling him because he didn't pick me. <laughs> I say, we're really excited to be working with you on 123 Main Street. And I wanted to call and just make sure I understand when and how you want to be communicated with during the transaction. And again, he's still kind of stunned because nobody has ever done this to him. And so Jeremy says, oh, well, you know, I just need to know when it's, it's ready, ready to close. OK, great. Are there any other times during the transaction you'd like to hear from us? And then you start talking. And he says, oh, I prefer email over voicemail. Great. We will do that. So that's the first touch. That's a great opportunity. And you let them know in advance that it's your goal to do such a good job that they want to direct their next deal to you. Now, that's pretty salesy, right? say, look, I, we just want to impress you, so you want to send some business our way. I would love if you do that. For most people, that's a little bit scary. So another way you can say that is, Jeremy, we just want to be sure we exceed your expectations. Period. Leave it at that. That goes back to that service thing that we're pretty comfortable with. And then the second touch point for the other side agent is when you're clear to close. Now, nine times out of 10, this is an email. Why not follow it up with a phone call? And again, nine times out of 10, you're going to get the voicemail. So you leave that voicemail and say, hey, Jeremy, it's Cindy over at XYZ. Just want to let you know we're clear to close on 123 Main Street. It has been an absolute pleasure working with you. And we'd love to work on your next deal. I can be reached at blah, blah, blah. Leave your phone number. So that's the second touch. The third touch for the other side agent is after it's done. Wait 24 or 48 hours after closing and give them a call and say, hey, Jeremy, Again, Cindy McGovern, XYZ. What did you know how we did? Was there anything we could have done differently during the transaction to make your life a little bit easier? How did your clients like the experience? And then that's when you want to ask them for more business. And you can even just say, you know, we'd love for you to use us when you have a choice. That's another way to ask. But that three-point touch system has unbelievable results. And I, I want to just share two with you that are from very recent. Two weeks ago, we had one client. And it was the first time she'd ever done it. So this was the very first time they'd ever done a other side agent. And I gave them one week to do this for all the deals that were opened that week. And in that week, they did. They did the three-point touch system for all the deals that were opened. And they brought in three new deals from it. That's pretty darn good. In one week to get three deals that were completely cold, people that weren't directing business, simply from giving great customer service. It's pretty amazing. And then another client of ours, they did this for a little bit longer. We had them for a couple of months. And in the coaching with them, we coached for two months, so we're right in our third month at this point in September. 
And in their first month, they were kind of getting comfortable with it and comfortable with making calls. And in their second month, they started to see the results of this. And it's literally the way that they do business now. It's just part of the life of a file, which is really my dream for you, that this is just the way you end up processing at some point. But in that second month, they brought in seven. So seven non-directing deals. And I'm, I can't wait to see what we bring in this month in September, because I think it's going to be even more. In fact, my goal for them is to double that. So I'm, our goal for September is 14. They've brought in two already, so we're on our way, but I, I really want them to get to, to 14. But if you think about that, all you're doing is giving customer service. All you're doing is giving a touch point of saying, hey, we just want to make sure we're doing our job to the best of our ability. You're probably cutting down on inbound phone calls, let's be honest, because they're going to call and ask questions. But if we're giving them that information up front, even better. And it's a chance to involve your whole team. So who can be making those calls? Well, that's like we had talked about in the very beginning. Who holds the baton at what point? So at the very beginning, that could be open entry person, whoever that is. In the middle, clear to close, that's probably your escrow officer or your processor. Or, or your processor. At the end, that could be your salesperson. That could be your manager. That could be your owner. So there's three different people that could even be doing this. So you're layering the relationship within your organization with this particular prospect, too. It does work, but it only works if you do it. And so you've got to get people wrapped around the fact that sales is not icky. These are the goals. Everybody has a chance to affect these goals. And here's some tactics to do it. And the scariest part for them is they go, but what do I say to these people? I don't know what to say. And I totally understand that. They don't want to sound salesy. They don't want to sound cheesy. But you've got to say something. So one thing that you can do as a team is create what I call a differentiating statement. It's just a statement that says, this is why we're different, and we would like for you to come and work with us. That's all it is. There's four components to a differentiating statement. The first one is who you are. Second one is what they get by working with you. The third part is how you help. And then ask for an appointment. So you're just saying, hey, I'm Cindy McGovern at XYZ. And my goal is to help you get your deal closed as fast as you can and make it easy on you and your client. And with my seasoned escrow team, I really feel like we can do that. So I'd like to talk to you about it. I can be reached at 415, blah, blah, blah. But you've got to teach them how to tell their story. When we're coaching salespeople, so when we're actually coaching a rep or coaching an escrow officer to sell, this is the hardest exercise we do with them, I'll be very honest. Because it's hard to tell people what makes you special because you feel like you're bragging. And it's hard to put it into words. What you'll find if my managers and owners on the phone, when you do this with your people, what's going to happen is they're going to want to say, I just give cu good customer service. They're going to want to bucket it as customer service. So help them unwrap that a little bit. Help them unwrap it so that they can understand what that really means. What is the customer service that you're offering? Oh, it's good communication? OK, well, let's say that. Oh, wait a second. It's because you have 30 years of experience and you can see problems before they become a problem? Let's say that. So just help them to be able to find their words and don't script it. I can't say that enough. Do not give them scripts. Yes, if you Google sales scripts, you will get hundreds of thousands of hits. Don't do it. And here's why. It's somebody else's words, and it becomes somebody else's. So you can certainly start with a script as a, as a framework, but that's why I give you a formula, the four bullet points that need to be included in it versus a true script. Because the script feels cheesy. It feels canned. It needs to be in their words. It needs to be in the way that they talk. And it needs to feel comfortable to them. And you have got to practice it. So every single person that's on this phone today, what I would challenge you with, and I am totally opening myself up to this, create your own differentiating statement. Start with you, truly. Create your differentiating statement of what you could say to a prospect, let's start with prospects, about why you're amazing and why they should send you some business or why they should sit down and talk to you. And I'm going to give you my email address at the end of today, and you are welcome to email it to me, and I will help you edit it. That is free coaching for you, my gift to you, because this is how important I think this is. 
you've got to understand what it feels like to go through the process to be able to help others go through the process. And it's really hard. It, it's, it's not something that happens naturally for most of us, myself included. It's something you've got to practice. So I am absolutely happy to help you guys to do this, but it's got to start with you, and that's part of that walking the talk as well. So it's things that we can do to start moving towards the sales as an organization is you can do campaigns. You could pick one of these five R's and do one a month. You could do one a quarter even. But focus it in so that everybody knows what we're doing today. And the other thing I would say is don't do too much all at once. And that's a big mistake that I see a lot of people make is they want to do it all at once. You know, let's do referrals. Let's do this. Let's ask for new business. It, it's, it's overwhelming. And remember, you're helping other folks who already have a full-time job to add this in. So it's really tough. And so give them things to start with that are easy. And one of the things is you can just ask them to ask for business when they hang up, right? So before they hang up the phone, is there anything else I can open for you today? That's an easy one. But it's hard to ask for if they haven't practiced it. But pick a couple of the monthly or quarterly campaigns to go ahead and implement. And keep track of it and keep track of the success. You can do contests, too. I'm not a huge fan of contests only because I believe this should be part of the job, not an addition to the job. And contests make it seem like, well, if you did this special thing, then I'll give you this special prize. I think that this should be revised in everybody's job description. <laughs> Everybody has an opportunity to sell. So this is a huge piece of it. So you could certainly do a contest to kickstart it and maybe give some reward around people you know, doing the right behaviors to bring in business. But I'd be very careful because it can easily become a trend that they're expecting another contest. You want target lists, and you want accountability for this. So have everybody come up with their top 10. And it could be the five R's. You could do two in each category for each person in your organization. Managers and owners on the phone with me today, scrub the list, make sure there's no crossover, and then hold people accountable to reaching out to those folks. And that's a really easy way to start as well, especially if you give them the five R categories because it does give them something to think about specifically, and they go, oh gosh, you know, I used to work with, with uh, Isabel. I'd love to work with her again. So help them, give them a little bit of guidance. You can also do call blitzes. And I will tell you, this is one of my favorite things. And it's old school, but it's a lot of fun. Get everybody in a room and have them dial down to the list. Have everybody make those calls together. There's some magic around the energy in the room when people do that. There's some magic around just having fun with it, too. And everybody's in the same boat. So you could certainly do that as well. If you have a remote team, that is also a possibility. You can have everybody call into a conference line, do a kickoff, send them out to make calls, and bring them back at the end of the blitz. So that's an opportunity, too. And then file checklists are one of my favorites. You guys all have checklists for your files. Why not just implement that three-touch system for the non-directing agent into your file checklist? Why not make part of the file checklist the fact that you've asked all parties for another order? And that's part of how you check off the file. And you can provide scripts, like I said. You can certainly offer that. My preference, once again, is that you help them to find their words. But scripts might be a good start for some of your teams, just to help them get going. And then you might, have to, might need to do training and development. You might need to pull everybody in for a two-hour session. You might need to play this webinar for them and help them. You might need to play some other webinars, play a YouTube video, or hire somebody to come in. But they will need to learn this because even though they inherently know how to sell, they may not necessarily know how to do it in this space. So you want to help them to feel comfortable. And then finally, executive level selling. That's kind of where we started with you guys leading the charge, walking the talk. And executive level selling can even be doing a focus group with your clients, bringing 10 of your clients in and saying, hey, how did we do? What could we be doing differently? We would like to earn more of your business. That's a really fun way to, to be able to get some feedback. Of course, it gives you a captive audience to ask for business. So the number one thing that you can do to grow your business and really get everybody growing the business and selling is to ask for orders. As silly as that sounds, if you don't ask, you don't get. And if you think about it, 
people ask you for orders every day. We don't call them an order, but somebody asks you if you want fries with that. Somebody asks if you want to upgrade this. Somebody says, do you want to add this to your order? The server at the restaurant asks if you want an appetizer, asks if you want a dessert. These are all asking for the order. It's around us everywhere. Everybody sells and everybody is being sold in some way, shape, or form all day, every day. The advertisements that come to you in your inbox are sales. But think about how you can help yourself and your team to feel more comfortable asking for business. So final pieces, address the ick factor. Talk about it. Get it out. Get that big boogie monster out and have a conversation around it. It's a true thing, and it's real. And if you can't get people past that, it's going to be very, very hard to get them rallied around a common goal, which is your second piece. And then help your team to see their own value. That's where you really want to talk about the things that they do that are awesome and why it matters to our clients. Yeah, we have 25 years of escrow experience, but what that does for our client is it helps to make their life a little bit easier because we know the process and we can guide them through it so that they can focus on getting more business. We got this part. That's a big piece, but you've got to help them to be able to say that. And then implementing the five R's like we had talked about, retain, refer, renew, revive, recruit, all the fun stuff. But pick one to start with. I can't impress that enough, guys, because it really does get overwhelming if you try to do all five. Pick one a month. See how it works. See how the team does. And then, of course, last but not least, my most favorite on the planet is ask for the business. You've got to make sure you ask. And again, this could be just the way you hang up the phone. It's, hey, did I answer all of your questions today? Wonderful. I'll call you when we're clear to close. Are there any other orders I could open for you today? That's an easy way to do it. It just becomes part of, do you want fries with that? And then you hang up. Nine times out of 10, they're not going to have anything, but that's OK. At least you ask, and you let them know you want to help. So Jeremy, I know I went a little over. Sorry about that. You know me. Um, so I want to open it for questions at this point. So hey, Cindy, no, no. Timing, timing's good. We've got about 10 minutes. Uh, Cindy's all yours, so audience, if you're out there, you know, send us your questions. We'll, we'll pitch them over, over to Cindy. Uh, we've had a couple come in so far. Uh, Brent was asking if there's an easy source um, for more information on market research regarding, regarding what realtors and rent lenders want most. What are they looking for? <laughs> 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 well, I will answer that question very basically um, from us. So, so our market research shows a couple of things. I will give you the top three. So what realtors say that they want from their title company is, number one, their check. Believe it or not, they actually say that. Number two is they want to look good. And number three is they want referrals. So it really all goes to checks, more checks, and ways to get more checks. So if you can phrase your service or whatever it is that you're presenting to them in a way that lets them know your goal is to help them get paid faster, more frequently, or at a higher dollar, that's going to make a whole lot of difference. In terms of the actual research, I mean, obviously we share that with our clients and we talk with them about it. But those are the top three, and that will get you started. The lender side is not that different, although we have noticed a change in some of the um, answers as of late because of all the compliance stuff. So the compliance piece seems to be coming a little bit more forward. They still want the deal closed. They still want to look good. But the compliance piece is sneaking in and making sure that we have all of our ducks in the row to make it easy for them. So that's another piece. OK. All right. Thank you. Um, Cassandra was asking okay. if you could review the four points of your differentiating statement again. My favorite thing in the world, absolutely. <laughs> so the first point is who you are. So, hi, I'm Cindy McGovern, Orange Leaf Consulting. Could be as simple as that. Second thing is what they get by working with you or sitting down with you. And this is where people want to throw in, I want to give you great customer service. OK, nobody cares. Don't talk about that. So this is where you could say, my goal is to get you paid fast. My goal is to make your life easier. My goal is to give you proactive communication so you're never without an answer when your clients need one. So that could be any of those things. Now, granted, those are all customer service, but I'm unpacking it to define it. So the second thing is what they get, what's in it for them. Third thing is how you help. So that might be me saying keeping you informed with my years of 
escrow experience, or if I'm a sales rep saying, I want to be your one point of contact so that you never are left without you know, a resource, something of that nature. And then finally, the fourth piece is asking for the appointment or asking for the business. Saying, you know, I'd love to sit down and learn more about how we can work together. I can be reached at 415, blah, 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 if it's a voicemail. Or this can also be an email, and you would just put your contact information in there as well, but letting them know how they can get a hold of you to have more of a dialogue around it. So who you are, what they get, how you help, ask for the appointment. Ask for the appointment. There you go. All yeah. right. <laughs> All right. Kelsey uh, has a question on... on on why providing value isn't enough. So she wants to know, how do, you, how do you avoid getting into price wars with your competitors? Okay, oh boy, <laughs> this is a big one. So the price thing is tough, but I want you to think about it in your own life. So you have a name brand something in your house, whether it's laundry detergent, dishwashing detergent, something is name brand, right, or else we'd all have just generic everything. The reason you have that is because you have a perception of the value that that provides to you. So if you're using, I don't know, Tide, you have a perception that Tide is better than the other one. Now, whether it is or not is irrelevant, and you probably haven't tried every single detergent on the market, so you can't honestly say whether it is or isn't, but you have a value attached to it. Price is only in question when value is in question. When I think it's apple to apple, that's the only time I will go to price. So when people are pushing you on price, that means we didn't do a good job of telling them what we do that is different than what they're currently getting. So when I'm coaching folks on that, so let's say that you're, um, you're a, a title agent and you're talking to a realtor and they're like, oh, I use all three title companies. You guys are all nice. I like all of you. Ouch. <laughs> okay, first of all, that tells me that we didn't do a good job of convincing this person that we actually are different. And second of all, we probably need to understand this person's needs a little more so that we can stand out from them. So part of it is having a conversation with them about what they're looking for and what the value is that they want. And I'll say this again, we run into this trouble with a lot of our clients because we assume they just want good customer service. We assume they just want the deal closed. Let's not assume. I mean, maybe we need to do that intake survey of finding out when and how people want to be communicated with, even with our current client base. When's the last time we did that business review? So it's looking at what value they expect and want and being able to provide it. When it comes to price, that tells me we have not convinced them, period. And so we've got to dig deeper, find more about what they want, and then go from there. That being said, there are markets that we've worked in that are very price conscious, and there are subsets of markets that are very price conscious and sad but true. Some of them will just go on price. So that being said, it may come down to price, it may come down to split, but I will tell you this, if you can find out what the needs are of that client, be it a title agent, a realtor, a lender, does not matter, if you figure out what they want and you can position yourself as the superhero to give them that, price is no longer an issue. That's right. You can be the rock star with the price. Uh, a little bit of a pl uh, selfish plug for our annual convention. Uh, Cynthia, you, you, you said it, though. Cons customers do not buy on price. In one of our um, Omni Session speakers uh, during annual convention next month in, in Scottsdale, Ryan Estes is actually going to touch on this point as well during during his discussion, oh. and, you know, talking about how – Consumers default default to price in the absence of value and, and a quality experience. So definitely along the same lines, Cynthia, is what, what you were saying. Um, yeah, and 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 one more thing on that, Jeremy. If you think about your own life and things where price doesn't matter, it's always where you don't see a value difference between them. No. <laughs> so if you look at it just from your own your own experience, like I will pay more for a certain airline if I'm going on vacation because I don't want to be stranded. <laughs> so, you know, I have a perception of value around that. Or I will pay more for this particular brand of, you know, shampoo because I have a perception of value around it. So if you can liken it to something in your own world, it'll help you to make that argument a little bit more to your client and or prospect. Okay. All right. Uh, I have a question from Brent, and I hope 
I ask it correctly. I'm not exactly sure where we're coming from here, but he's asking how can a title company provide referrals, and I'm guessing how can he provide referrals to the real estate agent or the lender, or should we focus on helping build their brand? Well, I think it's the latter, actually, because if you're giving referrals, you're going to run out real quick because you've got a whole lot of customers that are going to expect the same handout. So it's the difference between giving them a fish and teaching them to fish. So I look at it as from a consulting standpoint, right? So we go into companies and we help you to learn how to fish for yourself. That's really the gift you want to give to those realtors, too, is help them create their brand, help them to build their business, and know how to build it more. The realtors that I personally have coached aren't great at asking for business from past customers, believe it or not. There's an assumption that because you bought your house with me, you're going to come back. They're not great at keeping in touch. They're not great at asking for referrals. So those are places where you can actually just help them by saying, hey, this is how I do it. Why don't we try to build that into your book of business? And why don't we do that with your past customers? And quick story, there was a, a top producing team that I coached this many years ago in San Francisco, top producing realtors. They've been top producers for seven years running. Okay, so these guys are making a ton of money. They were horrible about keeping in touch with past clients. I literally had to sit in their office with them while they made phone calls to past clients to reconnect. No joke. <laughs> so sometimes it's their own fear of the ickiness of sales that you might also have to coach them and help them through. So it might even come down to just that. All right. Uh, Brent followed up. He said that was his point. So he, he thanked you for uh, expressing that that sentiment. My so. pleasure. Um, again, just a reminder for any any questions. We, we are coming up to the top of the hour, so we are going to be wrapping up uh, shortly. Um, question for you, Cynthia, Cynthia on um, kind of maybe a, a new phenomenon that most title companies, escrow companies, have experience is with walk-ins. You get a consumer mm -hmm. comes in off the street. Um, yep. what, sh what should a company do to be ready for this? Because you know, I think more with, as consumers become more and more aware of the great services the industry provides, it's probably not going to become a, over, a majority of the business, but these are going to probably happen more and more. They are, and um, if I can add a shameless plug, I will also be presenting at all about our evolving customer. Um, and so Linda Grohovic and I will be doing a, a presentation on that, and we're talking about some of these changes with our customers and how we communicate with them and what it looks like. So these walk-in pieces it, is going to be part of that because they are. And you'll find that more and more even with millennials because they've already done the research, right? So they've talked to 14 people, they figured out title companies, and they want to learn a little bit more if so they might pop in or email you or something like that. You've got to be ready. But that's where making sure that your receptionist or whoever's at the front understands that their job is sales because you're convincing this person that this is the right place for them. If I come in off the street and there's nobody at the desk and nobody greets me for five minutes and just looks at me crossways when I'm like standing in the lobby, I've made my decision. So it's making sure that you're rallying the troops everybody's rowing in the same direction and they understand what that that whole experience should be. Whether it's the person who's got a flat tire in your parking lot and is coming in for a glass of water, or it's a realtor or it's a consumer, it doesn't matter. That experience needs to be the same. And I've got a blog that, if you guys aren't signed up for our blog, please do so. There's great free stuff there. You can actually forward it to your clients as well. But our blog coming out, the next one, is actually on that about a friend of mine that was applying for a job at a university and the security guard that he ran into the day he went to look at campus was actually the person that sold him on wanting that job, believe it or not. So we've got to make sure everybody in the organization understands that they are in sales. All right, Cynthia, I, I, we've got two more questions. Uh, i got one clock that says 2 o'clock and another one that says 157. So I'm going to go with 157. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> if you don't mind, we'll, 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 uh, we'll address these two questions. All right, uh, question from Donald. I uh, hope I pr pronounced that correctly. Um, what can a company do when uh, they have clients that have dealt with a difficult person in their office, no longer with the company, how can they go about repairing that relationship? Oh, okay. So this is one of the tough ones, and, and we do a lot of coaching on this too. It's about letting that person talk, and you're not going to get a chance to be right here. I hate to tell you that. You're going to have to take on water, and you're going to have to actually apologize for what happened because it was still your company and you're all in the same boat. 
So the key is to get this person to the table to at least talk it out. Because what you'll find is a lot of it is just the fact that they need to be heard and need to be heard around the fact that their needs were not met. So if you can get them to the table, have some questions ready for them around, you know, tell me what this is. And then letting them know that you understand where they're coming from and you can understand why they're upset and then asking them to come back. But my guess is you've tried to get them to come back and they're not. You've got to get that dialogue first. You've got to get them to sit down and actually talk it out, play therapist with them, and get them to see that things are truly different. And it's also probably going to be a lot of your interaction. So if you're asking the question, Donald, I'm guessing that it's you that's going to be talking to this person. So talk about what your involvement can do to meet the needs that they now have. You know, what is it that they're looking for that they weren't getting previously, and can you be the one to provide that? Or can you ensure that your team is the one to provide that? But let them talk it out. Like, truly be the listener. That's the biggest part of it. That's right. Communication, great tool. All right. And uh, I thought we'd get a few, few questions on um, uh, compliance. Uh, now, neither Cynthia nor I are attorneys. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll refer you to our uh, compliance webinar re webinars on RESPA Section 8. Um, but, you know, anytime you are doing sales and marketing, you should always be aware of the, the regulations at the federal and state level, you know, federal level RESPA, uh, and then any, any particular additional regulation that your state may have as far as, you know, as kickbacks. Um, so Ryan's question, you know, he's saying, Title insurance industry highly regulated. Yep, and mm -hmm. a lot of title companies all offer the same services. Yep, the three factors we constantly run into are one kickbacks, two free legal advice, three pricing. And as you stated, we already provide the expected exceptional service. How are title companies able to differentiate and compete legally? So, okay, this is a much longer conversation, and honestly, we could do a whole <laughs> webinar on competing against RESPA violators <laughs> because it's a whole thing. In a very quick nutshell to answer your question, and by the way, if you have more questions about this, just contact me. My email address is on the screen. I'm happy to talk about it. But with RESPA violators, A, does the realtor know that's, you know, they're breaking the law. They know that. That's okay. But you're not going to win because somebody's always going to have a bigger boat. So you don't even want to play that game. What game you want to play is create a whole new sandbox. So you're not going to win the, they're going to have these tickets for this game. Okay, now you can get box seats. doesn't matter. Like, you're not going to win that. Someone else will always have deeper pockets. you got to create a whole new sandbox that says, I get it. Keep getting your tickets from them and keep sending them that amount of business. That's fine. What I want to do is work with you on how to grow your business by working with us, and then I'd like that business, and I'd like the opportunity to earn that other business. So you've got to have a whole different conversation with them because you will not win the rest of the conversation. And I will say this too, some of them are just freebie freaks. They are going to take whoever is the highest bidder and that's it. But if you're going after top producers and you're going after career agents, most of those folks get it. And they're not going to risk a deal for icky service over there just because they get tickets to a game or a concert. They're not willing to do it. The same thing goes for ABAs and JVs, by the way. They're not willing to risk it giving it to the in-house title company if the service isn't there, if they're not getting what they need. So you can certainly steal market share from there, and we've done that very successfully with a lot of our clients. But the key is some of them you're just not going to win because they're after the free stuff, but try to create a whole new conversation around not about free stuff, about their business itself. All right. Thank you, Cynthia. Well said. And uh, just a reminder, if you loved what you heard today, uh, Cynthia will be speaking at Alta's annual convention next month. She's uh, going to be on a session that's going to uh, dig into helping attendees learn how to uh, target customers of all ages, including the, uh, the, the growing millennial, millennials. Um, looking ahead, our uh, next webinar in October, we will turn to TRID. Fun stuff. Uh, the public co comment period uh, to the CFPB's proposed amendments uh, to a TRID closes October 18th, so we will have plenty to discuss. Uh, keep an eye out for registration information for that webinar. And uh, with that, that will bring us to the conclusion of today's presentation. Uh, Cindy, uh, thank you again for sharing some of uh, your sales strategies and uh, your five R's.
And uh, you are most welcome. All right. Uh, I hope all the listeners found the presentation useful. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.